Okay, we are live. Microphone check. Video? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Live video or audio or both? Both. Both. Uh, Moose doesn't have a mic. Oh, it moves your mic's behind you. Way, way back. Way behind you. On the stand. <clears throat> Tell me when I can start. Uh, well, L- Luther, Luther got the questions? Yeah, I got them. I got them back. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Good. <clears throat> Dad, can you see the question? Can you see the screen? Yeah. Moose, give me a mic check over there. Mic okay. check over there. <laughs> yeah. Sort of. Literally right now. Test, test, test. You hear it? Can we go? Yeah, you can set it up. Yeah, you can go. Um, we're on this camera first. This over here? Yeah, until Jake aims it at something. Jake, you ready? Which one are we on for? We're on that one, and we're going to go to this one. Okay, that one. Hi, folks. Welcome to our new shop. Take a quick pan around, uh, Jake. This, we moved in this week. Actually, I think it was last Friday or Saturday. This is our, this is where we'll do all of our filming. This is my shop where I work. Quiet. We'll give all the details tonight, answer some questions for you. Got lots of stuff to cover, but you, know, you got a question right away, Frick? We get started, jump right in, make Luther happy? Sure, yeah. Okay, give me one. All right. Oh, wait, you know what? No, Sue down in... No, she's not on yet. Oh, she's not? No. All right, we'll wait till she's on. She's uh, a good friend. She asked me to answer a question for her. Okay, so this one comes from Paul Bolton in Rockdale, England. Paul Bolton. Bolton in Rockdale. Hi, Paul. You're up late. Actually, you're not. It's not that late. And he says, what's the best dust extract system for a small home garage-based workshop? Well, uh, so I got introduced, I don't know how many years ago, to this cyclone concept. And I'm, in case you don't know what it is, there's uh, the two-stage dust collectors, which essentially is the material runs through the actual squirrel cage, and then it goes into a big bag. The heavy stuff stays on the bottom, and the top section of the bag acts as a filter. And I don't know if that's... It's doing the job, but I don't think it's giving your, getting your air really clean. So Oneida, and maybe we can put a link into their system. They have... You can make your own, and if it's really small, I suggest you do this. So they'll sell you a little cyclone kit, and it's essentially a funnel-shaped piece of, uh, at, on the small versions, it would be made out of plastic. And the idea is as you draw air out of the top of this cyclone, think of a tornado, as you draw air to the top, the air coming in, being pulled in from your machines is on the top side. So as the material comes in, it's the, the velocity of it coming in causes it to spin around on the cyclone, and as it spins and gravity pulls on it, it eventually drops to the bottom. The dirty air, the dusty air, ends up going out the top through whatever filter system you have. What's really nice about that is, I think they say that 99% of the particulate actually ends up at the bottom of the cyclone, meaning it doesn't go through your system, doesn't clog up your filters. So this is our, we just bought our second system. Now, what, do you remember what size shop, how did they rate this in terms of how big of a shop well, it was for? It's rated for two, four to six inch dust ports at a time. Okay, so you can run two to four. N- no. 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 Two. Oh, two four inch. Four to six inch dust ports okay. at a time. So if you look around, that means when this is running, you could have your uh, your jointer running, the por- the air sucking on your jointer and on your table saw at the same time. Or planer. Or planer and any bandsaw. Actually, all of the ports here. Are four, which actually so. is is not bad because if you're in a shop by yourself, you're only going to be using one machine at a time. The smaller, the only downside to the small machines, and this is the reason why I always had mine 
uh, permanently attached to each machine is if I, I don't think I could, I'm patient enough to be the type that would drag your unit from one machine and hook it up to the next one every time you could go back and forth. I'd say the heck with it and breathe the dust, unfortunately. So my recommendation is look at see what Oneida has. If you can afford it, great. If you want to save some money, you can just buy some of those components and then build your own. Uh, my very first dust collecting system I built myself from material that I scrounged at the local landfill because there was a lot of people that were converting from forced air furnaces to electric baseboard 30 years ago. So there was lots of ductwork available, and I just bought a big old I, a restaurant, used, a restaurant equipment sold used gear, and I bought a big uh, blower. It was about that big around diameter, and I built a big box. In fact, there's an article written by Mac. Oh, I got his first name. It would be. It was published in Fine Woodworking on dust collection back, and I'm going to guess and say that it was in the mid '80s. You can do a res uh, you can do a search on YouTube now, or on uh, their website now. And the Mac Campbell. Oh, I got it. It's actually from New Brunswick. Mac Campbell, C A M P is in Peter, B is in boy, E double -L, L. And he wrote a really good article talking all the ins and outs of it. So if you can find that, well worth reading. And then you can adapt it to whatever size shop that you have. My recommendation. Next, Frick. Uh, Aaron Fenn in the chat. He said, hey, Aaron. What is, Rob's well. what is Rob's opinion on the flip carts to maximize the footprint in a small shop? I'm sorry, flip carts? Yeah, where you have something on the bottom and something on the top, and it flips Oh, over. oh, oh. Chops on. Oh. Well, um, the downside to anything like that is when you have a combination machine or anything that changes from one function to another... That what you gain in convenience, you're going to lose in some precision somewhere. So I'll tell you the horror story. I grew up in my father's shop with a shopsmith. Oh, did I hate that thing. Shopsmith was, uh, was a lousy lathe. It was a terrible, unbelievably dangerous table saw. And if you have a shop stop, saw stop, plug your, or a shopsmith, plug your ears. I'm not going to get any better. Um, the drill press wasn't too bad. And then you could buy all you could buy an attach a bandsaw attachment for it, and it had a jointer attachment. Anyway, it was a, designed to be a light duty, multi purpose tool that you could take from job site to job site, which is why my father bought it. But you had the inconvenience of having to switch back and forth. And when I'm in that mode, when you're building something, I don't my brain is running, and I don't want to be stopping and having to reconfigure a machine. So I'm not in favor of anything like that. It's a little off topic because I think what you're talking about is just having a, I think what he means is it's a mobile cart and you have, you might have a portable belt, a portable thickness planer on the top and literally the cart flips around like that and up from the other side comes something else. So I have never used it, Aaron, so I really can't give you a, a qualified uh, opinion of it. My only concern is anytime you have a machine that changes from one to another, you're going to lose some precision. So if you can build that in without, or build that feature of maximizing space without losing anything that way, that would be smart. Um, I think I want to say, I have a good friend, Mike Smrek, up in Ontario that has a, uh, or had a Felder. And that was a very expensive, I think it was fifteen or $16,000. And it was a multi-machine thing. And he cursed it because anytime you went from the thickness planer to the jointer, the tables would never line up. And... Uh, I don't think they've improved it much, for what that's worth. Frick, next. Okay, so Sue is here now. Hello, Sue. We're missing you. We wish we were there. You might want to be here. Sue, by the way, is, in, uh, is near uh, Orlando, Florida. So every time we would go down and teach, she would come to the class and we'd go to dinner. I remember that place we had that lemon chicken. Oh, that was so good. Anyway, Sue had a question. She wants to know about a chisel. So, and the question is, when do you use it flat back down? When do you use it bevel up? So, I'll give you an example. If I was, if I was wanting to uh, clean something up on, the piece, on this piece of wood that's essentially flush, and I just had to be in there and remove a small amount of material, 
I would keep the back flat and I would go in and it gives me a tremendous amount of control because of the way that it controls the depth of the cut. However, if I'm in a situation where, now the, the downside to that, by the way, is you really, I, just, I said something incorrect. You really don't have a whole lot of control of the depth of the cut because if it starts to take a nose dive, uh, what you've cut becomes the guide for what you're going to cut. So as this surface tips, it's going to keep driving the end of the chisel down further. To control that, if you flipped it around, now you have the bevel on the wood, and that acts as a great point of leverage, or as you guys like to say, leverage. Is that what the Americans say? Leverage? Megan. I call it a lever. You call it a lever. lever. So I, call, talk, I said, oh, but we say leverage. Isn't that funny? Yeah, never mind. I just answered my own question. I haven't heard anyone say leverage. <laughs> but we say lever. That's weird. Isn't it? Well, we would never do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's Queen's English. Leave it at that. So with the, with the bevel down, I can now lever against that crest right there. So as I start to dig in, if I need to adjust it, I can just pull down a little bit or raise up, and I got a lot more control. So if you want lots of leverage... You're going to have the bevel down, and you can control your depth of cut. If you're trying to get something that's perfectly flushed off, if I, if I had put a wooden peg in there and I was just trying to flush it off, would I be better off with that little short bit of reference, or would I be better off with all of that reference and laying that chisel nice and flat? Hopefully that's an answer to your question. If it isn't, ask again, Sue, and we'll give it another attempt. Now, before we go to the next question, I want to bring something up. So, was that two weeks ago that we talked about the... Last week, yeah. Okay, so in this building that we're now in, by the way, I, I have to commend Jake. Even though he spent a ton of money, he did a really a good job on the ductwork. A ton of money. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to know. So the ductwork in here is all custom made from a company called A1. First Choice. First Choice. Why do I think A1 all the time? I don't know. Maybe A1 and first sauce. choice. Huh? Steak sauce? Yeah. <laughs> I don't need steak. Uh, local company, and this is all spiral ductwork. So if you're putting in a dust collector, a fairly large one, five horsepower or bigger, you, they, they'll tell you that you need to use the spiral ductwork, the uh, snap-together stuff that you typically have in your house for, for blowing air. You put that in a situation where you're drawing a heavy vacuum, and it, it has a tendency to collapse. So this stuff is really strong, very rigid. And you can run long spans without any problem with the dipping. Uh, we'll talk a little more about it as we go, but just take a look at that up overhead. Uh, most people would walk into a room like this and say, oh, there's ugly pipes, but we see beauty in that. Anyway, so in this building, which is a 4,000 square foot, square foot footprint, what, what's, what's our length, Jake? 60? In the total building, I think yeah. it was like 65, 56. Okay, something like that. But whatever, it adds up to 4,000. So, <clears throat> um, would it be two thirds, the classroom? Not quite two thirds of, the, of this building, it's not ready to show you, is our classroom. We're all, where we'll have 16 benches out there. That's where we'll teach our classes with the uh, PHP. At the back end uh, of, that, of that particular space, there is a quiet room, and there's two bathrooms. In behind this building, directly on the other side of that wall, is our very special uh, mess hall, because we're going to feed the three, do the three meals here. And then outside, on the other side of that is our, our commercial kitchen we're putting in. Now, I told you that because... Oh, yeah, right. So what we want to do out here is we want to create the uh, hand tool woodworking ambiance. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice, we've got all this bare space on the walls to put in some nice displays of, of various hand tools. So I thought, well, the first thing I thought of was uh, a collection of planes. And I, I didn't think I'd collect them, but I guess I do. So these are the bedrocks, and here's, how we, here's where we've gotten so far. Uh, we've got a number eight. Luther sent that? Yep. And Luther helped us out just the other day. He sent us a number eight and a number five. Not that one. 
Number five. 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 So right now we have a, a number eight. And, and in case you didn't know, Bedrocks were the premium professional hand plane that Stanley made, discontinued somewhere in the early 30s. We've got an eight, a seven, a six. Who's that out there? Who's peeping in on us? That would be Bentley. An eight, a seven, a six. We didn't have a five. We do now. Wait a minute. That's a five. No, this is, I'm sorry. Six, five and a half. We're missing a five and a quarter. We got a five. We were, we were missing a four and a half. We got it's a right four. It's right there. Why don't you grab it? Yeah. Well, I'm going to show them in a second. Okay. And I thought we had a three, but we don't. That's another four. So here's what we need to do. I to bought. What? We have oh, you did buy one. Okay. So we do have a three coming. So we, we to complete the set for our display, we need a two and a five and a quarter. That's all we need. So here, I'll show you this. I, I uh, and answered, uh, somebody called me the other day. There's an older gentleman who's sick. He had to sell off his shop. So I bought some equipment from him. And there he had, sitting in his pile, he had a four and a half bedrock. <laughs> At least it was. So we've got some parts. We're going to try to keep it as original as possible. We're actually going to do a video cleaning this up. But everything's there except for the uh, front knob and the rear tote. But as I said, we have a, a couple that would fit this vintage. And we'll get this all cleaned up and actually make it work. But it'll, it'll join our collection. So we're almost there. If you know of anybody that has a Bedrock 2 or a 5 and a quarter, now we're getting into the ones that are hard to find, we would love to know about it. We'd be happy to buy it from you to uh, complete our set. And we'd certainly take donations. I, I also picked up from the older gentleman, I picked up three big draw knives. And we'll put a display. We've got lots of room out there. Luther sent us a whole bunch of hand saws. You'll see them sitting out here. There's three and there's another half a dozen or so down underneath that. So we'll have a hand saw display. We'll have a hand plane display. Oh, a um, friend of mine, Dennis Lee, up in Ontario, sent me... Uh, three, four, four original, brand new Stanley uh, Sweetheart 750s, which was there. No, it wasn't the Sweetheart. Mm. It was just the Stanley 750 bench chisel, brand new. And they're kind of a, a collector's item as well. So we're going to just, I want to make something out there that is really cool that the guys that come here will remember. So I just wanted to show you that. And now I'll take another question. Okay, this one comes from, um, where'd it go? By the way, I have a TV now that I can read the questions, but not when he changes it. Did I change it again? Yeah, there it is. Uh, this one comes from Eric Christiansen. Hi, Eric. Where is he? Doesn't say. Doesn't say. He's in the chat. He says, Rob, can you give insight for shop setup with disabilities in mind, loss of vision and wheelchair accessibility in particular? Uh, loss of, uh, I'm sorry, what were the disabilities? Loss of vision and wheelchair accessibility in particular. Wow, loss of vision. I don't know what I can do with that one. Um, we have had a little bit of experience with uh, wheelchair because we've had, um, how, many, how many vets have we had that were in wheelchair? Aaron? We've had three. Three? We had one fellow that, uh, oh, no. that uh, shoot four. collapsed. Four of them. Uh, and uh, on a jump, and par he, he was left paralyzed. And then we had... Uh, Nichols. Andy. Oh, Andy, yeah. Andy Nichols was in our very first class. Andy was a lieutenant commander in Iraq, and his um, Humvee was hit by uh, an IED, and whew, that uh, did a real number on Andy. Uh, good guy. And I was amazed to see how hard he would work. He stayed running with everybody else. And then we had... Jeremy Brees, and Jeremy, who was a sniper with the U.S. Army, was actually providing cover for a group of Canadians, I believe it was in Kandahar, and Jeremy always said, the first thing they teach you over there is never go on a path, because they're always going to booby-trap them, but they had to get to this particular vantage point, and they had to go through this gate, and he, he said, I was just turned to the guy who I was with to say we shouldn't be doing this, and boom, stepped on a pressure plate, and his rifle took the brunt of the blast that probably saved his life, but he lost both of his legs above the knee. But he's got them now. He's got legs and stand up. Saw pictures of them the other day. Jeremy, if you're on, looks great. So, and who else did we have? Oh, oh, uh, Ivan. Yeah, Ivan was um, was a marine. Is a, is a marine. Always a marine. 
never was. And Ivan got hit by a sniper's bullet, two, two shots. First one took part of his finger off, kind of spun him around, and the second one came in, went underneath his armor plate, and went in and destroyed his bladder and paralyzed his left leg. So he was in a wheelchair as well. Now, he could stand up a little bit. Now, I tell you all this just because I want to say hi to them. But also, so what we did for Jeremy, we took the bench and uh, we sawed the bench off and dropped it down so, so it was at working height for him. But he still ended up having to uh, wrestle himself up on top of the bench in order to be able to get behind the plane. And I've always thought we need to do more work on coming up. If I was going to build, if I was wheelchair bound, I think what I would want to do, I would want to make a horseshoe shaped bench. And the reason being is that you could get behind, you get inside that horseshoe and you'd have something to rest yourself. If you think about it, when you're planing, it's pretty much a leg exercise. You're doing a lot of pushing with your lower body. Unable to do that, it would be nice to be able to have, I probably want it padded too, have a backside of the bench so that you could push against so that would be one thing I would do. I would make a horseshoe style bench and a fairly deep horseshoe so that you, you, were, you had lots of surface area to push against. Now you're gonna wanna keep this area free in order to get your, your chair around it. But if you, if you had that horseshoe shaped bench and then you had your base going, a three piece base out there along the end and back there, that would make it plenty sturdy. So that would work well. And that's where you spend most of your time. So if you can get the bench knocked down, then I think, I think this vice works great, even in that application. Uh, your tail vice would probably need some modification. Mm. Now, there's also a, there's a bench hardware that you can get that is, uh, has a scissor lift, lift on it. So you can, you can elevate, raise, and lower as you want. And it's really easy to do. And that might be something to look into because uh, I would think that you'd want to have fairly low when you're planing, but you'd want to bring it up when you're uh, cutting dovetails or joints or anything else like that. So U-shaped bench with a, some kind of a scissor list, lift so you can raise it up and down. And that's my best advice for the bench side of it. If I can come up with some other ideas for the Jake, rest I, of the tools. I lost, I lost video, Jake. All right, let's go audio questions while we're waiting Quick for that. Quick switch to the camera. Oh, you can go over there? Yeah. Um, just a second, I have some here. What? Oh, Loren's on. Stan LeBert. Anything to incorporate horses, eh? So, Loren, if you order from us, and you've already, you're on your second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh, 28th order, you should be getting a phone call thanking you, and it'll come from my daughter, Loren, out in Calgary, who is studying to be... An equine weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> what, was the, what was the term? I had her specifically say it for you, Chris. An equine something or other. She massages horses and does acupuncture on them and all kinds of stuff like that. Now stop right there for a sec. Megan's here. So if you are a combat wounded vet that has been to any of our classes, how many have we done? 13? I got some good news. Megan's going Megan's gonna to tell us about shortly too. If you've been to any of our 13 classes and you're watching tonight, we would love to know that you're there. I want to do my best to stay in touch with you guys, and we'd love to give you a shout out. So, in the chat, in the uh, comment, it's the chat. Frick, we're the linked. chat. And then she'll spot it and, uh, and shout it out to us. Frick, what did you want to say? Do you have some already? We have had Philip Lawrence and Ray Dorn. Hi, Philip. And who? Ray. And Ray and Ray down in Mississippi, uh, Louisiana. Louisiana. Cool, Ray. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ray. Give your question. Give your phone. I lost my information for Kyle. I'll read a question later. Uh, okay, so this one comes from uh, Stan LeBur in Switzerland. Hi, Stan. He says, in a shop where it is often difficult to control temperature and or humidity, how can you protect tools and equipment from rust? Uh, Rex, go grab me a couple of plain sacks, please. We answered this last week, didn't we? Two weeks ago. Kyle, Kyle Perel's yeah. on here. Kyle's on? He said he's here watching and sweating. <laughs> I'll tell you about Kyle in just a second. 
Yeah, uh, so I'm going to come back to the question about rust. I'm going to go Rex, go get it so we can actually see. I just want to introduce somebody. So way over here on the other side of the room, Jake, way well, over here. On the well, other side on of the room. that. Oh, how come? You're not working? I'm not on right now. You're not. So way over there, how am I going to point the camera if I'm trying to do this? Oh, it's not working. Not working. All right. Well, Chris Davenport is here. So Chris is an engineer with a company called PEC. And uh, we go back. Our, Pardon? RPC. Okay, RPC. Well, not PEC. Oh, that's, that's Julie. They're in uh, California. What's her name? Uh, Julie. Julie. No, not Julie. No. Leslie. Leslie. Anyway, RPC. And that is, I'll get him to tell it actually in a little bit. But they're, they're uh, helping us in a big way. They, uh, they do a lot of machining for us, and it's fantastic. In fact, Chris has been a godsend to us and enabled us to be able to do what we're doing now. Yeah, Back here. Okay. Flash over to Chris. And his wife is also into horses, so we, share, we, are, we are in a brotherhood of pain. And Moose is here with us as well. Ken couldn't be here tonight. He's, uh, he had to fill in for his son to play a father and son hockey game with his grandson. Okay, next. You got it? Rex? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, Tom Conley in Indiana. Hi, Tom. It says, what would be the smallest size you would recommend for a hand tool workbench bench? <laughs> yeah, so this that's one's that's this one's Super It's still dusty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we made this for Super Dave, but he we have to have a platform for him to, for him to reach. So... Actually, this? it's a bench to suit his caliber. <laughs> so we can do small things and have small mistakes. So um, I'll just tell you about that little bench. I built that for Rex. What? No, Jake. No, you were the first one. Oh, I had no interest in this. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, if you ask your mother, that was your bench. And then it went to Jake, and then it went to Bo. Yeah. Well, one of them. Um... And it was a it was a exact duplicate. I made it for Christmas, I guess, one year. So I even got a little shoulder vise in there. I never got around to finishing the tail vise. Huh. But you could go in there kind and cut like dovetails. Kind of like everything else. What? Kind of like everything else. <laughs> Remind me to tell the uh, urn story tonight. Mm. How small of a bench? Well, oh, Super Dave just texted and said that he has a plane to add to your collection if you're looking for a cobalt number four. <laughs> yeah. It's also, terrible that we laugh at all these inside jokes. You forgot to mention that uh, Ahmed has a five and a quarter for him. He does? I didn't five know Five and a quarter. A Bailey five and a quarter. Oh, a Bailey five and a quarter, not a bedrock. Well, that'll, that'll do Ahmed until we can fill it in with the... Hey, thank you very oh, much. And They're not easy to get. And uh, someone in the chat said, asked if we were willing to trade for a number two. But we should clarify that it is a 602 that we are seeking, not... Yeah, we two. have a two. I have a two. We, we, we're, 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 what we're wanting to do is be real picky and actually fill out the line. So just in case you don't know, that's, this is the one that he's showing? No, no. no. A 605. No, we, we, no, we have a 605. Good, your planes are... Where's the uh, one and the two? I thought they were in here. I sold them to pay for the ductwork. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, somewhere in here I have a one and two. But the, so the number two that we're looking for will have flattened off sides here on the top. That's how well, you can tell the difference. That's what we really want. That's what we want, right. That's what we're searching well, some for. Of, some of the... Okay. I got to open this up and show you. So who was asked the question about... He was in, in, in Switzerland about... Uh, uh, Stan LeBurr. Hi, Stan. This is uh, the absolute best solution... We, d we decided to sell these not because we thought it was a good idea, it's because I had used them and had great success with it. Tell you the story real quick. We're doing a wood show out in Victoria, BC. I live on the other side of Canada. So all of our tools were in this huge monstrosity of a case that when you, when you open it up, it had two big doors like that and all the planes and saws, everything was displayed. This is my, when I was with Lee Nielsen. We would packed it all up, first time I did this, shipped it, to Victoria, and it was at least a week before I got there. We landed, I landed at the airport, get over to the show. Of course, my case was already sitting there in my booth, open it up, and everything was reddish brown. Everything had surface rust on there. Fortunately, a couple of the volunteers that were there helping me 
and we spent the entire day with these little things called, um, and fortunately we had them because we actually used to, we sell them. It's for taking rust off. We spent the day scrubbing rust off of this. I said, oh, I cannot deal with that again. So we found out about these. You can put oil on, you can put wax, but anything like that is going to attract dust and that gets caked in around. And if you've got oil, you're going to have it all over your wood. So you've got to wipe it all off, wipe it on, off, on. It drive me nuts. Like I can't do that. So here's what it is. We, we found out about these from the shotgun industry. So it's a big tube sock that is silicone impregnated. It's got a drawstring on the end. There's four sizes. Uh, one will fit your jointers. One will fit your jack planes. One will fit your smoothers and a small one for your block planes. And all you do is put your plane in there, pull the drawstring. It won't rust. I used these for seven years doing wood shows. And I have proof because they had holes in them from the amount of use that they got. Never had an issue with rust ever again. It is the solution. How much are these? 13, 14 bucks. Okay. So not expensive. Save yourself the grief. Pick them up. They're on our website. And like I said, there's four different sizes. And it's listed on there what they'll fit. Now, I'm thinking I missed somebody else's question. Did I? No. Oh, yeah, the small bench, the small bench. Um, the bench that we use for the class, it measures 5 feet by 20. And I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't want to go any smaller than that. But I'm a helter-skelter type. So when I'm working on here, if you saw what this bench looked like today, there's a shooting board always on one end with a... And there's chisels and there's planes and saws and the, the tool tray's always full. I can't imagine working on anything smaller than what I work on now and I find this too small. So at the absolute bare minimum, if you want to come over and take a look at it, we just built this one the other day for a different purpose. But this one measures, I'm pretty sure this is five feet. Yeah. Six yeah, this is five. 60 inches by 20. But I wouldn't even say... I would say 24 because you would want a tool tray. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't want to go any smaller than that. Of course you could. I mean, you'll, you'll fit yourself into it. Bentley, do you want to come in and have a seat? Well, there's a seat right there. Come in and sit down. Bentley, Bentley wants to grow up to be a woodworker. Come on in. This is Frick's oldest son. Good hockey player. Definitely the most handsome. Look at him. Over there, the seat, chair, over here, right down there. There you go. Right in front of the mic. Now listen, take a lesson on this. Take the opportunity to take your grandchildren or your kids out into the shop. In other words, they're not going to know anything about this. Come 20 years old, 25, they own a house, they won't have a clue how to use a hammer or a screwdriver. So it's up to us because they're not doing it in the schools. Um, I'll get off my soapbox now. Ahmed said Ahmed that he said. will cut off the top <laughs> yeah. Thank you, of, Ahmed. The, of the <laughs> five and a quarter to make it a six oh five and a quarter. As well, Aaron Fenn has access to a 602. Oh, wow. But, it, but one side is, is broken, but he said since it's a display. Oh, yeah, that's, that'd be perfect, Aaron. A absolutely. Absolutely. Contact me. Contact us. You got, our, you got our contact information. We'll find out. That'd be great. So that'll take care of one display. We probably, uh, maybe, we'll, we've got all kinds of room out there, and I just, I want to color this up. I want, when these guys come, and I'm talking about the vets, but I can't, I can't leave out the uh, civilians. I want them just to be a memory that they'll hold for a long time. So the more memorable we can make it, and when we're ready to give you a tour, you'll see what we've done in the, uh, in the uh, mess hall, and it'll be, you'll be happy. So thanks, Aaron. Next question, Frick. All right, this one comes from Julian Flores. Julian? Yeah, he's in the chat as well. He says, what do you recommend a, Hi, new, a new woodworker buying first, a jointer or a planer? And what size do you recommend? And he's from Texas. So you're talking power tools, a jointer or a planer, and what size? A uh, jointer would have to be number one before a planer. But, but you know what? That's almost, a, that's almost like saying, do I buy my car or do I buy gas? Well, you're not going to get anywhere with one or the other. You have to have them both. And to have a planer and not a jointer. But so I'm going to say it's a 50.2 versus a 49.8 split in favor of the jointer. It's but what? Before that, you should have. But he's asking about those two. I know. But I'm you, trying but not you to take specify. This. You're taking me down another rabbit hole. No, I'm not. I'm just what? saying. He, he, he should be picking between his number two tool because his number one should be the table saw. Right. Maybe he already has that. 
So I'm going to stick to his question was joiner or planer. So I'm going to let's focus on this joiner for a minute. Don't buy anything shorter than an eight inch joiner. You it'll it'll satisfy you 85, 90 percent of the time because you're going to use it to face joint, meaning flatten the face of the board. And a number six is just always going to end up being short, too short for something. So stick with the number eight, uh, pardon me, the eight inch jointer. And as far as the thickness planer goes, so I've had 24 inch. I've had a 20, we have a 20 inch. I've got a 15 sitting out there. I've got a 14 sitting there. I've got a 12 inch one over there. Crazy, I have a bad habit. That 14 inch planer, we, I can't, I can't even remember the last time we used the full capacity of the 20 inch. I can't think of a time in the recent past when I wouldn't have been able to do everything I needed with the 14 inch planer. So 14, 15 inches is all you're going to need. You think it's great to have that extra capacity, you may never ever use it. So joiner first, planer second, eight inch and 14 or 15 inch. Most of the common ones now are 15 inch. Um, That's my so, recommendation. So just to be clear, a six inch joiner is useless. You should be only getting an eight. Just, just to, so we're clear with Super Dave that, oh, is you've that what he is? if you've got a six inch, you're really not a woodworker. <laughs> <You're not. laughs> well, I would certainly want a six inch joiner versus nothing, but you said I'm going to buy one, and I don't know if the price difference is that great between a six inch and an eight inch joiner. So, buy the eight inch, buy the eight, and we, I, we've had we've had uh, eight inch joiner six eight. 12, 16. And, and we've got a 16 over there. The, the 16 is sitting over there. The knives aren't even in it. When was the last time we needed it? Well, you needed it recently, but... I did? Yeah. Oh, yes, and we couldn't use it because the knives were so bad. Knives were so we took the knives out to get sharp and then put it back in. So, yeah, 8-inch will work great. Okay, next. All right, next one comes from Joseph. How, how's our time? When, oh, and, oh I, I want to talk about Kyle for a second. Hold on. So Kyle Perel lives in Newfoundland, Newfoundland Regiment. Oh, my, I didn't bring my, my things over. Kyle was, uh, Kyle and Jesse, Jesse Rufiange, were the first two Canadian combat wounded vets that we had in our class. This is when we were teaching up in, uh, up in uh, Niagara Falls. And uh, Kyle's a great guy. So I called Kyle up today, and I said, Kyle, I'd love it if you could go on tonight and be our guest to tell everyone about the Purple Heart Project from your perspective. So he's sweating in Newfoundland, and it has nothing to do with the temperature because it usually snows there. So we're going to get him on at about 8 o'clock. You're going to love this. Okay, next question. Uh, I, just got, I just saw a good one come in, and it said, in planning my shop layout, how much real space do I need for my table saw? Oh, good. All right, so come back, come back over here. So if you can kind of get a, you can kind of get an idea. So there's my table saw, and it's almost centered in the room, which means you're going to deal with sheet goods. Sheet goods typically are eight feet, although we've got some MDF over there that Moose is going to demonstrate later. It's five feet by twelve feet. He's going to show you how you throw that around. You want to warm up? <laughs> so eight foot sheet. That means you need to have, ideally. Eight feet, and I would suggest that you've got eight feet from the front of your saw, not the blade. You don't want to be trying to maneuver that on top of the blade. So you're going to want at least eight, uh, nine feet from the blade this way, and the same thing goes out the back. You don't want to be bumping into stuff. So you need a full eight feet from the back side of the blade, best to be eight and a half. On the side, now typically, if you're cutting a sheet of plywood, you want at least four feet to the right of the blade. And, but if you're going to cut something 60 inches, you don't need to have 60 inches to the right of the blade. You just simply do the math, which you wouldn't want me doing for you, and you would cut it from the other end. So as long as you had, oh, I would say five feet from your blade to my, your left, you're going to be okay. But I, when we built that last shop, I said I wanted to be able to drive a truck around my table saw because in our last shop, the First kind of gymnastics you had to go through to try to get that sheet into the place where you could even cut it was a bit of a, a nightmare. So that's my suggestion. And now if we're going to add it up, what do we got? 8 and 8, 16, 17, 18. So you probably want at least 18 feet in this direction. And I would say that you're going to want for 
six, at least 10 feet in width. So 18 by 10 would, I would say would be the minimum you'd want for your table saw space. That was a good question, by the way. Next. So this one kind of goes along with it. Joseph in Linden, Michigan wants, Hi, Joseph. wants to know, relative to hand tool woodworking, how much room would you recommend having around each end of the workbench? Okay, that's a little more of a difficult question to deal with simply because uh, the, your table saw is kind of being uh, uh, limited by sheet goods. But over here, you're talking about rough lumber. So if you've got a plain 14-inch uh, board, well, then you need 14 inches, uh, 14 feet out that way. So that one's a little bit tougher. I still, I like to have, okay, so let me just show you what I have here. We've worked with, I've worked around this for, I had my first really good bench in 1989. So how many years is that? 32? Yeah. So... No, really only 32? No, 42. 89? 32? 32 years. Like he said, you don't want him doing the math. Yeah. Right? So for the last 32 years, I've been working every day around a bench. So my distance that I have, so my sweet spot would be right here, right in the middle of the bench. And my... This, is, this is too close. Yeah. What? No, I don't think so. You, so our situation is a little bit different because we do a lot of filming in here and Jake's got to get all the way around. So we have to modify it. But right now, I like this. I am, I am about three feet. Well, from my bench to my tool cabinet is uh, 55 inches, which seems to be just right because it's nothing. It's, it's 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 one step to just about anything that you need. As far as out this end goes, of course, I'm being right-handed. So, and my style of bench, I need all of my length out this way. And I've got lots of room. Frick, grab that tape and hold it, hold it out there like that, right about there. So I've got, I've got uh, almost 10 feet from the end of my bench. Thank you. And strategically placed, there's a door there. So if I had to open the door, and I have a door over there, that's smart too. I did that in my, I did that in my last shop too with my thickness planer. I had it positioned with the door. So if we had to, we could open the door if we've been running a really long board. So in this case, I've got doors on both sides. So think about that, even a window if you had to. And the height, is, I, I would really like to have, oh yeah, I have two things I'm gonna tell you, height and depth. It would be nice to have lots of height over top of your bench for those times when you're doing something, assembling something and you've got a tall piece, think of a frame piece, and it'd be nice to be able to have it straight up in the air and not bumping into the ceiling. But the best thing I've ever had in all of my time in working around a bench was in my first shop, we were on the second floor. And I had a trap door purposely positioned right underneath my shoulder vise. And I could take that trap door out and I could cut dovetails at the end of a 12 foot board anyway? Um, Probably more than that. What was it, what was it sitting on, tens? I, I'll bet you, I bet you we, I could have cut dovetails at Easily. the end of a 14 foot board right here at this height. And the funny thing is, if you were to go back and look, that, that opening was probably modified no less than 10 times because you thought it was big enough until two years later you were gonna cut something just a little bit bigger and you had to go in and frame it out again and change multiple times. But having that trap door in there was perfect. We're sitting on a concrete floor here so we don't have it. So when it comes time to cutting dovetails on something really long, you gotta get really creative, so. If, if possible, have your bench on the top, on a second floor. That would be that would be the best of the best. Good question. Next, Frick. This one go goes with it as well. Terry Meyer in Kenyon, Minnesota. Hi, Terry. What is the proper comfortable height for a shop bench? Oh, there isn't one. So I'll tell you the same old story. Frank Claus is about six feet tall, and I think Frank's bench is thirty-two inches in height, if I remember correctly. Check the. Uh, there's a book called the Workbench Book written by Scott Landis, published by Taunton Press in 1980-something, 80 86, I think. Probably the best book ever written on benches. Gives you plans for multiples, but it'll give you all kinds of good details in there. So Frank's six feet tall, and Frank's bench was 32. I, with my shoes on, am five foot eight, and my bench measures 36 and a half. So that's quite a range. You just have to try it and see what you like. I will say this as, as a rule. If you're doing a lot of planing, it's nice to have your upper body on top so that you're leaning down on it. If you're doing a lot of joinery work, it's nice to have your bench elevated 
so that you're not having to bend over so much. Other than that, it's a purely a personal choice. If you ever get a chance to work somewhere where there's another bench, play around with the height and just see what's comfortable. Or make your bench so that you can easily adjust it. And usually, in fact, do we have any here? No, we don't. So when we teach the vets, or when we teach the classes, uh, sorry, I keep excluding the uh, civilians that come. I didn't mean to do that. On our benches, uh, the standard height is what, Jake? Of the benches? Yeah. I think it's 34. No, I haven't got one there. Well, measure. here. Maybe yeah, we have, well, I guess it's the same, same one. Same, same. So our, our, the benches that we make for our class, standard height is 34, 34 and a quarter. And we make a little, it's really simple. We've got a, a sleeve. So it's another foot like this with two pieces of plywood, one on either side that create a somewhat of a U. And it's a snug fit. So you just have to lift this up, slide that sleeve underneath, and you can elevate your bench three or four inches. And that's how we accommodate the real tall guys. So make something like that and just play around with it. Don't just do it one time. Just work with it a little bit, and you'll eventually find the perfect height for you, which will probably change as you get older. Next, Frick. Good questions, by the way. And I'm going to come back. I've got to talk a little more about the dust collecting system before we're done. Kyle's coming on in 10 minutes. We didn't even talk about our prizes tonight. So we do this as a fundraiser for the Purple Heart Project. In fact, I'm going to stop right now. I'm going to go over to Megan, and I'm going to have her give you the update, the latest information we have, as if we have some inside info, on what's going on with covid as far as the Canadian United States border and the inter Canadian border, because we were trying to satisfy a class there as well. So, Megan, please. Well, I mean, this is New Brunswick's, um, and it's all pending like federal regulations. But, um, first of all, explain your vested interest. What do you mean? You're an American. I'm an American. I Go want my out. freedom back. She wants to be able to go visit her family. So she pays closer attention to this than the rest of us. No, I didn't tell them. Well, um, and you also have to understand that, like, while the states have been opening up, we've been shutting down more, which has been... Well, we got, the, we got what, they, we, what they, when they had it bad, we didn't have anything. And as they get rid of it, we get clobbered with it, so... Well, clobbered seems to be an exaggeration. We barely had it here. Here, here we didn't. In New Brunswick, but... but some of our other provinces. I mean, it was just a couple weeks ago that the, they, they tried to impose the new regulations that coming into the province, you had to stay at a hotel at your own expense to $2,000 for the first seven days of your isolation. That was only a few weeks ago they tried to do that. Um, but anyways, they have just recently announced our path to green, which has never been even mentioned before. No, I haven't heard it. So, um, I may, somebody might not know that, but we've gone through this color scheme. Yeah. If, 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 how did it work? It, well, yellow has been like, wait a minute. I can the tell most you. Open. We could play hockey when it was yellow, when it was orange, we could only practice. And when it was red, we had to do it at night when no one was looking. And we never reached lockdown, which some places did, which meant that like even stores weren't allowed to sell essential, uh, only allowed to sell essential items. But, um, Anyways, basically, the 1st of June 7th, and this is all depending on, like, a certain level of people being vaccinated and, you know, cases being down, that, um, like, travelers, um, commercial travelers will be able to cross the border without being subject to isolation. And, um, but when, and, and when it comes to the border, the only big things are happening in July. It's saying that, like, if you have both vaccination doses then um you'll be able to cross without isolating um and um we are going to open up to maine so i don't know how they'll be able to regulate that like if people will be able to fly into maine and then come i don't i don't know a drive through yeah like um that's happening july july 1st july 1st the border between the maine. international border between the state of Maine and the province of New Brunswick will be open. Yeah. Um, but it also says that, like, international travels with two doses, it won't require any isolation. And international travels with no vaccine or only one dose will still have to isolate. But if we're going in between Maine, then the longest isolation you have to do is seven days. If you don't have any vaccine. 
And then August 2nd, they said that they are hoping that if 75% of New, New Brunswick has both vaccines, then there will be, well, will be green, which basically means all, like all mandates are dropped. Mask mandates. Borders are open. Borders are open. Like everything's back to essentially normal. So we talked about possibly having the first class just for the maritime, the four Atlantic provinces. So is that going to happen before the international well, so border So that's opens? supposed to happen in June, is we're supposed to open up to the Atlantic bubble. But not Nova but Scotia. But not Nova Scotia. Which is a big chunk. And July, we're supposed to open up to Nova Scotia. So. So if we put this in a blender and turn it on high, here's what we got. We, our first class, we may be able to run a class in July for vets and civilians living, living in any of the four Atlantic provinces. That's New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland. Quite possibly, and we're holding out, although Super Dave doesn't think so. We're putting you on the spot, Dave. We what may... a Nancy negative. What? What a Nancy negative those <laughs> two Americans are. We may, <laughs> we may very well be able to have, and Luther's going to shoot me for telling you this, but we may very well be able to have classes in October. There's a slight possibility September. I'm hoping October for sure. If so, we will do. We will squeeze two classes into October and even two into November if it looks like the weather's going to hold out. I know that's an awful lot of ifs, but we are desperate to get this on. So the good news is there's some light at the end of the tunnel, and hopefully it is not a train, and we will be able to go full steam ahead. Thanks, Megan. So, any more vets to say I do? Not that I've seen. Come on, guys. i got to call them. Start getting them on here. Um, so, what we do, we, I, we come on here and answer questions for you and entertain you as best we can. Super, Dave, Super Dave said, we are correct. We are correct? <coughs> Referring to him and Luther. Oh. <laughs> so, um, we answer your questions. We give away lots of prizes. I, should, I think Santa Claus is on tonight. I uh, communicated with him earlier in the week. He's sl slowly recovering from COVID, and he's on the mend. i got to say hello to my brother, too. My brother Randy out in uh, Alberta has um, po quite possibly has COVID, and I'm, not, I'm being serious, but he also has a very peculiar sign of it that I've never heard of anybody getting. So, Randy, <laughs> I hope you're doing better, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, so, anyway, we're giving away prizes tonight. You can register for free. It doesn't cost anything at all. We just do this out of the goodness of our heart. Moose supplies us with dead cat sweaters. Um, you want to tell a story about a dead cat sweater, Chris? So Chris bought one for his brother, brother-in-law, brother and then how did your nephew? And then you bought one for yourself. <laughs> Chris bought one for him when this is back when it was cold, and he texts me because he goes, "There must be a heater inside this thing." Because they're hot. And then he brought one for his 11-year-old nephew. And he won't take it off. Yeah, he wouldn't take his father's off. Oh, he wouldn't take his father's off. Buy him one. Yeah. Uh, you, you think we're kidding about that's this. A, that's a trend. This is. Everybody's going to have a dead cat sweater. No, I, mean, I, I a, take heat trend, for the name. It's a trend that people steal them from other people. Oh. Yeah, you did. You took one of mine. So anyway, here it is. It is extremely light. Hardly weighs anything. But it is the warmest garment. Why are we talking about that on the budding of spring and summer? Well, think about winter. And a friend of Moose's took care of the, of the, the expense of putting together the Purple Heart logo on it. So we'll give away three of those tonight, and we'll, we'll send you the right size. We're also going to give away, thanks to Willie the Wonder Man. So we have, we, just, we celebrated his birthday two weeks ago. Willie Dubay is an 80-year-old retired fabricator who, if you were to walk through our main shop, I could, we wouldn't have to go more than 10 feet, and every, within every 10 feet, I could point to some implement that he made for us that solved a myriad of problems and made our life so much easier. Well, these casters that you see on our benches, we need the mobility in order to move the benches around. The casters, as they come, they claim to be rated for a certain weight. They're not. You hit one little bump, and they bend, and they're useless. So Willie takes them and he cosmetizes them or he dubies them. He, well, he cuts out a piece of steel plate, welds it on, grinds it smooth, repaints it, and then they work, they become indestructible. So 
on every thousand dollar increment of donations we get tonight, we're going to give away a set of cosmonaut. Well, uh, what's this? Dubai's 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 casters. We're going to give away a, a bag of four um, bench dogs, aluminum bench dogs. A bag which, of four. A bag of four. Give away a bag of four. And uh, don't forget your maple syrup. It's uh, maple syrup is fresh because this is the time they're just finishing with the uh, boiling sap for syrup now. What happened to your microphone? I have, I have it set up for Kyle here. Um, oh. The, the, like the classes are already filled, right? Oh, say, say that again. People are asking if they can buy spots for the class oh. in August or October, but they're already filled. Yeah. I, I apologize. I mean, this stupid COVID thing has really thrown a, a monkey wrench in our plans. So, yeah, our classes, of course, all of our 2000 cl 2020 classes got canceled. So we rolled those folks over to 2021. We've already had to cancel... Our April class, our May class, our June class, and our July class. So we're trying to fit these people in. And there's only so much of us, and there's quite a few of you. We appreciate your enthusiasm. We would love to have you here. And we're going to do everything we can possibly to uh, provide you with an opportunity to come to a class. And I know why you're coming, and it's for the right reason. So thank cool. you. So now what we have to do is take everyone that we've had to cancel out of classes and reschedule them next yeah. year and the ones that want to come and then that's when spots will open. Yeah. It's uh, a bit of a nightmare. Stay tuned. By the way, I got to give you a plug right now. If you're not already on our newsletter, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that and it's not a newsletter that filled with flyers and trying to entice you to buy things. In fact, what, do, we, do we even sell anything through that newsletter? Do we do one? Yeah. Okay. So the newsletter every month has a theme. This month is putting in a dust collecting system in a small shop. So Jake and I did a video, and I like the videos when we do those because it's very relaxed. It's like this. I don't worry if I misspeak because it's just me talking to you. But we took you all the way through. We showed you our, our other dust collect system over there, the mistakes that we made, and the things that we corrected when we did this one. Hopefully to give you the information you need, the real in-time information for doing it yourself. And then Luther will write one or two articles on it. So the number of man hours that go into preparing that newsletter is pretty substantial. It's all for your benefit. And we, all, we always discount one item for the month that's there. Plus, our newsletter, we screw up when we make saws. Uh, we call them seconds. They're always cosmetic flaws. What was the most recent one? There was, uh, oh, Ian, when he was sanding the brass, if the engraving wasn't deep enough, a lot, some of the engraving got sanded off doesn't hurt the saw, but we can't sell it as a first. So it gets sold at a $50, $50 discount. And we only tell that to people on the newsletter. So if you're on the newsletter, you get this kind of information. You get one, you get one, so if you register for it, you're getting one newsletter each month and possibly one, sometimes, rarely, you would get two extra flyers that are always has something to do. And that's how we keep people uh, posted on what we're going on with classes and availability and all of that stuff. So go to my website, robcosman.com. Actually, somebody will put a link in there for you today and you can get on the newsletter and, and uh, reward Luther for all his hard work in doing that. Okay, Kyle? He's, he's Kyle's ready? Okay, so without further ado, I don't want to do I want to introduce you to Kyle Perel in Newfoundland. So if you think about going as far east as possible before you get to England, you're in Newfoundland. And Kyle's going to tell you, all I asked him to do was encourage other combat wounded vets that are watching tonight why they should register, and then it's going to give them an opportunity to say thank you to those of you who make it possible for them. So they Kyle... Have, they what? can't register, though. They can't what? Can't register for what? Sign-ups are closed. No, I, I didn't say that. You just said other vets Oh, to for register. vets. Well, as soon as it's possible. There he is. You haven't changed. <laughs> You're wearing a dead, wearing a dead cat? Wrong. Moose has got a dead oh, yeah. cat on. It snowed here Sunday. It snowed Sunday. Yeah, I, said, yeah. I said that. It's still cold there. But Kyle, take it away. All right. Uh, so I, I, I think it was 2017 I took the class, I believe. But uh, before I took uh, Rob's class, I was in a, I was in a pretty dark place. I had uh, chronic suicidal thinking. 
and uh, it was all, I was kind of going to New Orleans every year kind of deal, just trying to chase a, I don't know, sense of purpose. But I found uh, after Rob's class, I just kind of just got that sense of purpose back, you know, like I was trying to do woodworking before, but uh, it just felt like unattainable. And then Rob just kind of shows you that it is really kind of, I don't know, you can actually take it to another level kind of deal, which makes it a lot funner and more enjoyable. But I find that, um, like, like if you're just making a small box and just using a hand plane, it just drowns out all the other negative thoughts or emotions that you're just kind of tired with processing all day. And it just breaks it down to, you know, I got to take this piece of board, turn it 12 inches long, and then now turn it into three inches long, and it just makes the day so much easier to manage and... Uh, I don't know. It's really hard to put into words what it did for uh, did for me, and I know it did for other people as well. But uh, I mean, I go to therapy every two weeks, but I think the real therapy is the woodwork, and I do every day. Mm. I don't know why I'm going to therapy, but the wood seems to do it. She she tells me to do all different kinds of things, but I just end up in the shop anyways. But um, tell them a little I bit just, about your uh, military background, Kyle. Uh, I don't, I don't got too much, I suppose. I joined, uh, when I was 16 and then when I turned 18, I started, uh, training for task force 110 in, uh, Kandahar and then I deployed right after my 19th birthday and we had a bit, a bit of an interesting tour, but I went a long time after just kind of, I just couldn't deal, I don't know, I couldn't deal with it. I, I lost my sense of self-worth. I just lost i felt like i lost everything which reminds me too another thing that uh, this course does for you vets out there that uh, are thinking about you know you don't want to take this help or whatever these, these people want to help us and uh, it just gives you that sense of brotherhood back and sisterhood kind of deal you know i'll get a little emotional thinking about it but i don't know it just gives you this uh, we're, like i'm not into the community too much but i just know that the community's there and that's kind of what i've been missing i guess after my uh deployments and stuff like that but i ended up uh medically releasing with ptsd in uh 2016 i believe so i did just under 10 years of service i guess it was too much for me but through rob i found out i can uh i got a new purpose now and it's just to take a tree and turn it into something someone can look at you know and i just i just find that just amazing you know it just i don't know I know we ramble here because I'm nervous. How, how did, but, how did, uh, I also how did you find us? Um, I was YouTube. I, I was surfing YouTube. So when I got home from my deployment, any free time I had, I was just always buying little cheap tools and trying to learn on YouTube. I I couldn't go anywhere. I didn't want to leave the province. I didn't want to travel anywhere. So I didn't want to go to school to learn or learn woodworking for somewhere. Like I just I couldn't. I didn't have the ability. I guess to like function on myself. But then, so I was just learning through YouTube, and then uh, I just seen Rob's come up through YouTube, and he was talking about uh, the first guy that you brought in, Jesse. And uh, I was like, my God, there's something, something to do with this. There must be something to it. Cause, like, I feel that, I don't know, weird connection with wood for some reason, you know. But, uh, like, I remember we were all sitting down at in Niagara, and uh, Mike Smear passed around his guitar. And everybody just smelt it. No one ever, no one played it. Everyone just smelled the Spanish cedar in it and stuff. But uh, I, I found you guys on YouTube, yeah. And uh, no, it's been it's been a pleasure ever since. I I don't have chronic suicidal thinking. I don't. Uh, I mean, I still. It does not going to take away your symptoms that you deal with going to the grocery stores and all that kind of stuff and driving. But uh, gives you something to look forward to when you come home. You know, just go out and make a mess that's why i'm really good at doing that it's, it's something i've learned but it uh i don't know i can't uh i can't describe it but uh it just gives me a reason to keep going you know i don't know i wonder if when the people so simple, uh, i wonder if the people that, when sorry? they look in the window and they see a bunch of guys sniffing the guitar wonder about us Oh, definitely. I know people wonder about me anyways. <laughs> so I, it's nice now to you're normal. Where everybody else are kind of wondering too, but, uh, no, I, I, I gotta say, I don't know what it is about wood or I don't know if it's just like a natural material, but I, any vet out there that's 
you know, hesitant on doing it. I was really hesitant. I, when I sent Rob an email, I was just kind of saying hi, I think. And, uh, I almost regretted it right away. Cause I was like, Oh God, like I shouldn't have done that, you know, cause it goes against everything in our body to accept help, I guess, from people. But it's the best thing I ever did. And I, I encourage anybody out there that's debating it, even civilian or not, whatever. Cause I know a lot of civilians that like in our course that they, uh, they benefited a lot from it as well. I think I kind of got that connection with us vets. Cause I feel like us vets, we're kind of in our own little circle in society and Rob's kind of bringing us all together. And it's a, it's a great feeling. It's an amazing feeling. And, uh, that reminds me, I'm completely grateful or, uh, absolutely grateful to, uh, anybody that sends a donation or even just promotes any of this because the opportunity has been absolutely phenomenal. And, uh, I can't thank everybody enough. I got a ton of help. Oh, it's, it, it, it's blowing, it blows my mind watching these YouTube lives every time I can catch it as much as possible. It, it blows my mind how many people are out there that are just willing to give back or, or I, don't even, I don't think anyone should be giving back because I, I believe we all sign up to do our thing, you know, selfishly or whatever, but it's, uh, it's interesting and it, it, you know, it's part of healing too to accept that help from people as well. And that's, that's part of therapy and everything. And it's something that us veterans got to push past and Rob and the purple heart project and everybody involved is a good way to get that part of your therapy in, you know, but I feel like I'm rambling, but (laughs) (laughs) I'll let you you off the hook. Kyle, thank you. I I appreciate you accepting uh, the challenge to do this. No, I, I, I'm anytime, anytime you need anything. I mean, I'm across the pond, but I can, I can make a trek up if I can, you know. You, you, you've said that and before, like that. and I haven't forgotten. No, I'll come up. If you, if I get, if, if you can call me and I can answer, <laughs> that's when uh, I'll come up. No, no problem. Sit by your phone. Yeah, it's just a 16 hour drive. That's all. That's it. <laughs> Listen, Kyle, it. thank you. I hope things warm up over there. Oh, it's starting to. It's starting to. It's nice, nice and pretty out there. Oh, yeah, look at that. Bit. Snow's all melted. It's all melted. It only lasted a day, but we'll get another one. And thank you, Rob. Thanks, everybody else. And uh, thanks for the people that make these sweaters because they're unreal. I got me and the girlfriend one, and we're obsessed with them. <laughs> so, thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Take care. We'll be no in touch. Problem. All right. Bye-bye. See you. Okay, we back? Which which camera? Go this one. So give give me a, give me a question, and then I want to and I'm gonna talk about some stuff I got in the mail this week. Really interesting. All right, uh, Bart Thomas in Roanoke, Virginia. Hi, Bart. He says, of the current brands, which bandsaw and floor mounted drill press would you recommend? Oh, current brands. Well, Bart, I'm going to answer your question. I'll answer your question, but first I'm going to say this. I always look for the old stuff. In fact, just, just as a matter of interest, that thickness planer is built, and we know this because there's ways of dating it. This is built before 1963, almost as old, maybe even older than me. That lathe back there is probably 2003, 4, 5. That Rockwell bandsaw back there would be early 70s. That jointer would be the same vintage, early 70s. This disc sander would be early 2000s. That uh, mortiser, that company was purchased by these guys in 97, so I'm going to say that's somewhere in the 70s or 80s. That drill press, based on the label, that would be, that would be 1980s. The only thing I've got that's really that's new in here is the, is the uh, saw stop. And it's brand new. And it's brand new, yeah. We've only had it there a couple of months. We bought this grinder. We got this grinder the other day, too, and that would be, that would be uh, I'll bet you that's the 1960s. So there's tons of this stuff out there. Classic example, someone called me just a week or two ago, older gentleman, not far from here, uh, had a stroke, unable to do his work in the shop anymore. I want to know if I wanted to buy any of his equipment. So we went out there, and he had an 8-inch joiner. He still has a bandsaw for sale, a big 16-inch or 18-inch bandsaw, 18. Bought a lathe from him, had a thickness plate, had a full shop. There's, all, there's lots of that. you got to remember that the, the most of the guys that do woodworking are ones that had 
uh, exposure to it in grade school. Well, they stopped teaching that in, uh, pardon me, not grade school, but uh, middle school. They stopped teaching that in middle school probably in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. So most of the guys who woodwork are in their 70s, 80s, and even 90s. And there's a lot of that stuff that's coming up for sale all the time. So keep your eyes open in all the places that you would find it. Facebook Marketplace. What, what, what's the one you guys have? It's like our Kijiji. What's it called? Craigslist. Craigslist. Don't get killed. But lots of places like that. If I was buying new. Oh, boy. Uh, I bought... I had a, uh, I purchased a new bandsaw in 2005 made by uh, Laguna, um, sold it, did not like it. It was okay at first, but the, the busier we got and the more we used it, the more I realized I do not like this thing. Just didn't have the mass, it's steel as opposed to cast iron. And there's something to be said for really dense ca materials like cast iron that dampen vibration and make things run smooth. Mind you, they have to be balanced in the first place, but it's a lot easier when it's heavy. So I cross that one out. Powermatic, Jet, they're all made in Taiwan or China. I actually, I think China. So you're essentially getting the same quality, different colored paint. What was the other question? Bands on a drill press. So here's the biggest problem with the drill press. If you buy the modern drill presses, they've got lasers on them, they've got lights, they've got music, they've got everything. But you take the quill, this is the quill, and you bring it down. And down here, you take your drill and you can move your drill bit an eighth of an inch. Well, do you know what that does for your accuracy? The older stuff didn't work like that. It worked well. I, so I can't even recommend for you a drill press. I've got jets. They're all in that, in, in that category of sloppiness in the quill. I, I can't even answer this question for you because I cannot think of a brand, even a, an upper-priced small shop brand that uh, would satisfy me. And if it doesn't satisfy me, then it probably shouldn't satisfy you. Buy old, keep your eye open for the old stuff. Belts, bearings, and motors. Those are the three things that wear out. All three can be easily replaced. Add to that on a bandsaw, you have what's called a tire. So around every wheel is a rubber tire. But they make replacement tires. They make replacement guides. You can replace all that stuff. If you can find a good frame that hasn't been cracked or bro and broken, then that's worth salvaging. And I would drag it home before I buy anything new. Sorry, that wasn't the answer you're looking for, but that's the only one I have for you. Um, oh, so let me show you what I got. This came in the mail today. I don't know how it got through customs. Do you know what that is? That is a bag of beach sand from Omaha Beach. And if you know anything about World War II, you know about the sacrifice on Omaha Beach. I wouldn't want to have this tested for DNA. So this came from um, Nick Ross. Uh, here's the sand from Omaha Beach that I collected when I was there on June 5th, 2018. Also included some photos took from the memorial on the beach. So there's one picture in here that pretty much sums it up. This one right here. Crosses for as far as the eye can see. So thank you, Nick. I opened that up and I thought when Customs opens that up, but it made it through, so that's fantastic. Also received... Memorial Day weekend. Is this Memorial Day weekend? Really? Wow. Um, how come what? I'm not aware of that? What? Where's that, where's that uh, other sheet that I had here with Over the guy's here. name on it? By the water. Oh. I won't say his last name because they didn't ask for permission. But I received a $1,000 check in the mail this week. A donation for Purple Heart Project. Dear Rob, thank you for the work you do and your vision to create and implement the Purple Heart Project. Regards, John. His last name's on there, but no. I'll uh, respect his privacy. Thank you very much. Absolutely fantastic. Got to say hello to Angie. Angie is Ken's cousin. Angie and her sister Lynn pack up all of our t-shirts. There she is. Sorry, Angie. I got my calendar up on the wall over there. 
That's Angie. She's confined to her bed. But she is going to get... What, what are you pointing at? She is going to get better. We have a locker for her with her name on it out front. So whenever she gets ready, she's coming to work here. She's already working there, but she's going to come work here. By the way, in case you didn't notice, that's her putting her seal of approval on the T-shirts. So whenever you buy... A, uh, one of our three wood-themed T-shirts that have the Purple Heart logo on the right, on the left breast. Wood is wood for good. Wood is good. Wood doing good. Angie and Lynn packed all them up nicely. There'll be a picture on there of her and her little seal of uh, approval, which is an A. And Ken, hello. Ken would like to be here tonight, but he's uh, playing hockey. Did I tell you why I had these spokes, these uh, draw knives? I got these from that uh, gentleman as well, so we'll have a draw knife, a draw knife display. Don't forget to register for our, our uh, free draw for the end of the night, and don't forget to sweeten your tooth and pick up your your maple syrup. Now, speaking of dead cats, and Kyle, I thought that was a pretty good. Uh, see, if you live in Newfoundland, you're gonna wear these 11 months out of the year. The other month, you need to wear two. Um, if you want your own. There's so many good stories coming out about this. Anyway, go to patsecretgarden.com and Moose will fix you up with one. And he has a display of it up on there and a, st a stall at the city market with a little little blurb about the Purple Heart Project. So we appreciate his support. All right, you've got to answer a question here. before Luther kills you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. All right, this one comes from Norman Olson in the chat. Hey, Norm. He says, why prefer an L-shaped Scandinavian-style shoulder vise as opposed to a chain-driven twin-screw moxon vise? Well, uh, I'll answer it the easy way, and then I'll throw a little more detail in. So if you, were to, if you were to look at the last 50 years and say, okay, who are the most prominent hand tool woodworkers that we know of? One would be Frank Claus, Klaus, C-L-O-U-S. -E A-U-Z. A-U-Z, thank you. Actually, S-Z, yeah. Frank, you're good. And the other would be Tay Frid. And oh, that name gets butchered so bad. T-A-G-E, <laughs> last name F-R-I-D. Tay Frid, that's how you pronounce it. I spent some time with him in the summer of 87. Both of those guys are well known for their craftsmanship, their influence in woodworking, particularly hand tool woodworking. Both of them use a shoulder vise on a traditional Scandinavian style bench with a tail vise on the end. Mine's a bit of a modification. So you ask about a moxon. First of all, ask, read that for me again, please. I want to make sure I'm answering exactly. You got it? Give me a chance for a mouthful of water. He says, why prefer an L-shaped Scandinavian style shoulder vise as opposed to a chain driven twin screw moxon vise? Okay, so we're just about to cut dovetails, believe it or not, in plywood in our online workshop, which you should all join because you'd get to see a lot more. What are we making? Oh, this is a funny. We, we did this whole um, shop and we forgot to have provisions for hand power tools. So that's what we're making right now. And we want a mobile cabinet. So it's being made out of that same pine plywood like our... Uh, chop saw cabinet, but it's got to be dovetailed together. And you notice that my waste basket, it carries out all the things, all nicely dovetailed, of course. So if I'm wanting to dovetail this, here's how easy it is. I open up my vise, I slide it in. There are no obstructions, and it's securely held. There are no bars underneath there. Now, there isn't any bars on a moxon vise in the middle, but there is in both ends. If I had a moxon vise, then I have to take this, and I have to lift it up, and I have to drop it down here. Not so, not so problematic for something like this, but with bigger pieces, yeah, it's a little bit awkward. Still a good vice. In fact, it's a good option if you don't have a Scandinavian shoulder vice. A moxen vice essentially has two big pieces that are screwed, are pulled together on either end, and they squeeze, in, they squeeze whatever's in the middle, and they support it well. This is number one. That's number two. This is the best. There's also, and you could do the same thing with the moxen vise. There's a little bit of lateral movement here. 
so that if the piece that you're working with is not does not have parallel faces, it'll still hold it firmly. The last thing you want is to have a vise that only grabs onto the end, and while you're sawing, this side is flapping in the wind. It makes it very irritating to saw. So that's my reason, is because of the way it applies pressure, and in my years of doing this, I, there's nothing about this that I don't like. There's nothing about this I would want modified. What we did do is we had our own hardware made. A friend of mine locally, machinist, introduced me to something called a, a uh, double start thread. And all that means is, well, probably means a lot more than that. You know what a double start thread is, Chris? That'd be right up your alley. So all the other hardware that you would buy, you would have to rotate this six times to move one inch. With a double start thread, it'll move one inch in two rotations. So it's nice and fast. And usually you're not having to move this a great deal. So really quick. So now we, we have these made by a friend of our, mine, uh, um, Paul, up in Ontario. And Paul is, I just call him a genius because of all the, a lot of the stuff that we've come out with, I give this, I give the, I tell Paul what we want, what my idea is. And then between the two of us, he comes up with, he comes, I come up with the idea, he refines it, and he ends up producing a product with it. So Paul now makes these for us. So there's a big brass nut in here so that that doesn't droop. The only thing you don't want is, if this droops when it's out here, now when you put your board in and you're wanting it to stay perfectly positioned, if this has drooped, as you tighten it, it writes itself like that and it moves this out of place. So this works beautifully. And we actually have this hardware. It's not cheap, but it is good. So if you're building a bench, I would highly recommend that you consider the Scandinavian shoulder vise. If you can't do that, you could always put a Moxon vise on. But the twin, that chain-driven tail vise, no thank you. Not interested in that. The more complicated it is, the more things that don't go right with it. Uh, I like it really simple. I like to keep it simple. I'm a simple guy. Next question. What's Luther saying now? Do I want to know? I don't know. I see a lot of exclamation points. <laughs> oh, that's because he really liked what I said. Someone, someone, uh, Charlie McBride wants to see you beat Mass Matt Estelio's dovetail time. Oh, Matt! Matt is running for cover. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't. I'm just letting Matt stew. You know, you get them all worked up. Wait, do you mean, do you mean Matt Estella? <laughs> yeah, that would be Luther's version. So in case you're not clued in, I cut a dovetail. Actually, Frick, I, I, I have to give credit. Cre I criticize Frick all the time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to not criticize him now. Just keep the paychecks coming. You criticize yeah, me he doesn't care. So way back in 2008, it was around October, Frick said, why don't we, uh, why don't we do a YouTube video of you cutting a dovetail really fast? Well, I said, why don't we start a YouTube channel? And this would be the good way to start it. Okay. I'm trying to make this sound <laughs> even better. I know, but the whole channel was my idea. That's oh. what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. Throw in wherever you need. So anyway, Frank Claus had recently done a video. Uh, Glenn Huey was at his shop uh, doing some still photography for an article that Frank was writing for Fine Woodworking. And Frank somehow in the conversation said, "Do you with his heavy Austrian accent, I'm going to show you the fastest dovetail you've ever seen. Paint grade. He specifically said paint grade. That means when it's done, you paint it to cover it over. Not that pretty. And Frank took out his bow saw, and this was filmed. And his bow saw has a twist in the blade. So a bow saw is a big frame, kind of like I think of a big scroll saw or a big jigsaw. And uh, actually a coping saw is what I meant to say, a big coping saw. And the blade is twisted. So it starts, it's vertical here. By the time it comes back here, it's horizontal. So the idea is you would start cutting down the, you would start cutting down the side of the dovetail at the, with the first part of the saw. And then as you got to the bottom and you kept moving your saw, the blade was turned and the blade would cut to the bottom and then turn and go right all across the bottom like that. So there was no chisel work. It was just cut them out. And you'd pound them together. And it was kind of crude, but it was quick. So Frank had put that on, uh, Frank had put that on, or Fine Woodworking had put, pardon me, Popular Woodworking had put that on YouTube. So I said, well, let's give him a challenge. I know Frank. So I did what I called a cabinet grade one, and it, we ended up doing it, and it took three minutes and 40 seconds. 
And for a long time, people watched the video a lot, and it was a fast video, vast dovetail and blah, blah, blah. So apparently, Matt has been all uh, out of breath practicing, and he posted one the other day where he did it in two minutes and 58 seconds, maybe. So he was, <laughs> it's quite a noisy video. But he did it. So then the chat, and we had sent him a saw, actually. That's the only reason he was able to do it. Luther had an idea to send him a saw to let him try it out. So Matt, there's where you go. That's how come you're able to do it. So now Matt has sent out a challenge, and he said, if anybody beats my time, I'll send you this Cosman saw. So I'm going to get my saw back. Stay tuned. But you have to do it on a live episode, so it's not no. edited. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. But I got some, I, I've been thinking about some ways we can cut some time down, but well, I'm working on it. Don't you worry. It didn't go unnoticed. Just can't respond too quick. Got to draw it out a little bit. Any, any more bets? Brick, question? All right. Next question comes from John Hutchison in Irving, Texas. Hi, John. It says, can a hand tool shop that uses chisels, hand saws, and planes instead of sandpaper be set up within the house? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I pride myself on, on using sandpaper for less than 20%, probably more like 10% of what we do. It, uh, if you watch my 32 seconds to sharp, go on YouTube and watch that. And, and I get people almost on a regular basis that will contact me and say, you know, I watched it 10 times and I finally got it. And wow, he said, you simply have changed my life in the shop by teaching me how to sharpen. So you can, it, allow, it teaches you to sharpen freehand, which means it's quick and it's painless and you'll do it. Once you do that, you will be able to take the surface of a piece of wood above any sandpaper. So unless you want to rough it up, leave it alone after the plane. So yes, you can, you can eliminate, except for when you come into curved surfaces. And sometimes I, uh, I built lots of chairs where all the curved work was done with a spoke shave. So, yeah, you can. Absolutely, you can. But sharpen. Sharpen is the key. You must learn to sharpen, and you need the best sharpening gear. Now, this is going to sound like a sales pitch. Tough. You need the best sharpening gear. So go on our site and get, at, a very, at the very bare minimum, get the minimalist kit. That's the Trend Diamond Plate, the 16,000 grit Shapton a heavy holder, the ruler, the uh, sharpening ruler, the David Charlesworth sharpening rule, and you're good to go. Get the best gear, follow my technique, and there's no reason why you won't get the same results that I do. Next question, Frick. All right, next question. Good question, John. Comes from Fabio in New York. Fabio. What are your thoughts on having a radial arm saw in your shop? Oh, I have no thoughts of radial arm saws. I got rid of the last one. My father had a radial arm saw in that shop that I grew up in. I'm surprised I still have all of my fingers and my arms. It's got to be the most dangerous tool that was ever invented. If you think about it, you're cutting on a climb cut. So the blade is spinning this way and you're pulling it across the board. Make it even worse, they actually encourage you or tell you how to use it to rip a board. Just a nightmare of a tool. So no, no radial arms. They'll never give you a perfect anything. They're okay for rough cutting, but I would much rather have a chop saw. I don't use this. This is brand new. This is one of these new articulating, uh, what do they call it, an articulating hinge? Arm. Arm. It's really kind of cool. But I don't care how much time you spend and what blade you have in there. That is never going to produce what I would consider to be a finished cut. If you're, if you're putting trim on in a house, yes. But if you're building furniture, no. So... Radial arm saw, not interested. In fact, I don't even know if anybody even makes a radial arm saw anymore. I'm saying that without really no knowing it, but it's just, it's a tool of the past, not something I would want. It'll never be, it'll never be, uh, it'll never be a great tool. Next, Frick. All right, next one comes from Peter Carson in the United Kingdom. Hi, Peter. He says, hi, Rob. What are your opinions on the best flooring around your benches for comfort when working at your bench all day, six days a week? Ah, uh, well, this is, a, this is a concrete slab, so we're standing on vinyl tiles, which is not great. Over here, we've got what's called coin flooring, so it's a vinyl, a heavy vinyl flooring, and it's got this little round, looks like coins, there's some texture in it. I don't think it has anything to do with e being easy on your feet, but it does provide you with a little bit of traction. So in my last shop, we had those uh, half-inch thick, 
interlocking two foot by two foot square cushions. They don't last forever, but they're comfortable. Excuse me, right here, we've got some uh, industrial cushion that's about a half an inch thick, lots of traction, and there's a little bit of give to it. So this is actually quite comfortable. In fact, who knows, that might end up over here. So what would I recommend for a real cheap solution? And we used to, we have hundreds of these because we used to uh, use them at our wood shows. You'd be standing for three long days on concrete and we would put these down and you'd be able to survive. So go out and get the interlocking. I wish I knew what they were called. Rex, can you go grab one for me, please, just so I can wave it at them and show them? Right, just, just a square. Just uh, one of the, uh, one of the. You might find them over there. Yeah. I'll show you what they are. Yeah, I know a Walmart sells them. Home Depot, most of the places, you usually buy them in packages of four, and they're usually ten or fifteen dollars. So it's a really good, fast solution. Next, Rick. Uh, Philip in San Francisco. Hey, Philip. He says, when setting up a router table for your shop, would you recommend using bit guards? I would like to make my router table as safe as possible. I'm sorry. I don't know what a bit guard is. Okay, so uh, pause that one for just a second. So this is what we're talking about. Of course, they're dovetailed on the on this edge, so that's they're okay. And that's uh, it's actually a little less than half an inch thick, but... It's comfortable to walk on. You can connect them, and they even give you a little trim so they don't have those pieces sticking out on the outside edges. So pick up these. We've used them for years. And the ones that we've had in, in that other shop for three years are, st are still, two years are still sal salvageable or usable. Um, I don't know what a bit guard is. I apologize. I've never heard of a bit guard for a router bit. So unless we're just, we're not using the same terminology. If you can ask the question again, Try it in another way, I'll, or if somebody else on there can explain what it is, I'll, uh, I'll bow to your knowledge. Next, Frick. Next one comes from Craig in Muskoka, Ontario. Hi, Craig. He says, I have a 20-foot by 16-foot workshop in my basement and want to reduce the noise transmission from all the power tools to the rest of the house. Can you talk about sound insulation in the walls and ceilings as well as minimizing vibration through the cement floor? Um, so I have no expertise here, and I like to crank my music, so everyone around me uh, probably complains that I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to soundproofing. But uh, I know when we, built, when we built the apartment up above the shop, um, Junior, my friend who was doing a lot of the trim work, said if you really want to soundproof, you have to have two separate walls with a space in between because the sound transmission will, the vibration will go through the material, solid material. But he also told me about this, do you remember what he's talking about? Those little strips of something that you put on the wall and it just, it breaks that connection. Hi. It's called resilient channel. Can you describe it? You're on, Chris. You can, Shouldn't have said anything. You can purchase these little channels at most uh, home uh, renovation stores. And it, it just it goes on the studs before the drywall goes on. And so it, it minimizes the contact of the drywall to the stud. And so you end up with this little wee thin piece of tin, for lack of a better term, because uh, it's the only contact between the, the drywall and the stud. So it helps. They're used a lot in common. It's not the best way, but it's economical, I guess. There is some improvement. Okay. So when we, when we were getting the other shop ready, actually, I guess it was when we were building the apartment, I worked long hour, late hours down here, and uh, there was going to be people living upstairs. So we had an uh, insulation company come in, and they blew in cellulose infra insulation. And we paid a fair bit of money to have it done in between the floors. And I was told that I can play my music down here, and they will not be able to hear it. Well, that never happened. You could always hear it. So it deadened it, muffled it a little bit. And we literally tore the place apart so that there wasn't any cavity that wasn't being... Uh, that hadn't been insulated. So I don't know what you're going to do to deaden that sound. I would, I would uh, suggest that you do what, look at what Chris was talking about because we spent the money on having um, cellulose blown in insulation literally as a barrier between the shop and there everywhere we could and it still didn't make much of a difference. So I don't know. Not at the volume that you would the things at. Pardon? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um. Rick? 
Gary Bush in the chat says the router bit guard is the little plastic thing above the bit attached to the fence, which keeps your fingers from sh striking the bit by accident. Say, say that again, please. Bit guard. The bit guard is the little plastic thing above the bit attached to the fence. It keeps your fingers from striking the bit by accident. Oh, well, you, well I'm sorry. I have never seen that before. This is new to me. I'll look into it. So I, I can't comment on your question. Rex, would you kindly get me dry as a bone? Next, Frick. Um, I'm running out of questions here. Running out of questions? Yeah, but we're also running out of time, so it's fine. Uh, Dan Else in Culpeper, Virginia. Dan? What are your thoughts on the utility of mobile work assembly storage carts in the shop? What are my thoughts on use of... Uh of mobile work slash assembly slash storage carts in the workshop. Oh, well, so we had Willie make, we bought a couple of these carts and we had Willie make us another three or four and we probably need three or four more. They're, they're fantastic. Uh, in fact, I was gonna, I'm gonna get at least one if not two in here because you can keep everything. Well, here's an example. These are the parts for a little cabinet that we're doing for YouTube right here that's going to house all of my protective gear. These are the parts that are, we're doing on the online workshop that are going to go in this corner to store all the hand power tools. And before the end of the week, those parts will be scattered all over the place. So if I had, was able to put everything on a cart that was, and I always have three or four or 10 things going at the same time. So we want to be able to move in here for carts. But yeah, I think that's a great idea. Keep everything together. I just want to be able to find my hearing protection I spend at least an hour a week, if not more, while running through the shop trying to find where I set these down last. And the magnifiers. And the magnifiers. And my glasses, which are usually on my head. So to actually have a place for stuff is, is just a really smart move. Thank you. Next. You going to start making up some questions? This is terrible. <coughs> um... Freck, if you were going to set up your shop, what question would you want to ask me? I'll, th I'll have to think about that one. Uh, Gary Peterson. Hi, Gary. Rob, do you think lumber should be stacked vertically or horizontally at rest, at rest in your shop? Or does it matter if it's roughs on or S2s or S4s when in either of those positions? So good question. Really good question. Um, when I was, uh, well, when we built that lumber rack out there, you can't really see it from here, but we did that in the online workshop. And in my previous shop, I was always taught that you do everything you can to keep your lumber laying as straight as possible. You don't want wet lumber drying in a, in a non-flat position. And you just want to, your best bet is always going to be to have it lay nice and flat. Standing, no, I don't think so. For none, there's, a, there's the danger of someone knocking it down, and I've got little kids that are running around here half the time, so that's not a good idea. Ideally, you would want it laying flat, and you would also want take the time when you build your racks to make sure that they're all on the same plane, so when you put your board in there, it is laying flat. When you buy store-bought lumber that has already been milled, it's S4S, that means it's been surfaced on four sides. Flat on the top, bottom, flat on the top, flat and square on both edges. Chances are it's not going to stay that way very long. If you can keep it laying nice and flat so that the, it has minimal opportunity to move around, that's your best bet. So do everything you can to keep it laying flat and to keep it so that it is flat. How many times did I say flat? Next, Frick. I thought this was going to be a, uh, uh, such a hot topic that we would never get through all the questions. How come nobody's getting them? Well, Luther's answering some of them. Okay, Steve oh. back in the chat says, is the tool Hi, cabinet Steve. behind your bench finished? Are you going to publish some plans? No. So, so let me tell you something. Uh, can they go? Uh, so we have, since 2011, we started what was called the online workshop. And uh, we used to film five episodes a week. We would produce one half-hour episode every day, five days a week. We did that through the holidays, never stopped. Um, three or four years ago, we dropped it down to three 45-minute episodes a week because with my travel schedule, we just couldn't maintain 
filming every day of the week. Um, so in there, you get to watch the process of select designing, going through the process, coming up with an idea and how to develop it to go from paper into a model, into a mock-up, into a finished piece of furniture. Selecting your lumber and all of the process right through. We don't shut the camera off when something goes wrong. That's where we get the best ratings. And we don't do that on purpose. So I'm telling you that to promote your going on and at least checking it out. So we're Jake, if they want to go and check out the online workshop, what do they need to do? Where's Ken? They can go there and they can watch one episode of every series that we put out. So for free, at no expense to you, you can go in and watch one episode of everything that we've done in there. And we've probably made 50 different projects ranging from this bench... There's Gretzky. To, uh, yeah, how, how many goals did you get tonight, Ken? One. One? Two assists. Two assists? <laughs> <laughs> but who's hey, Moose, how many did you get today? None. None. <laughs> yeah. I have a maintenance day. Yeah. <laughs> so, let me tell you the story behind this. We started with the bench, and then folks asked us for, for a cabinet. So we decided, all right, that's a good idea. We'll make a tool cabinet. Well, this is a very personal item in that you're working with it all day long. So it has to be in rhythm with you, the way you work. It just, there's a lot about it that uh, if it's wrong, it's irritating. If it's right, it actually contributes to a really successful day. So what we decided to do was, we, I think we've actually built a model first. I, don't I can't remember, is that long ago? I have to go back and watch it. This was that back in 2012 or 13. I think 2013. We decided, and then we decided to ad advance it to a, a full-size mock-up. So you'll notice this is made out of inexpensive... Well, <laughs> I, was about to, I was about to say inexpensive plywood. This is gold. This is made out of plywood and uh, some pine. Might not want to discard that. Yes, true. You could sell that. So we built it. We had laid out where all the tools... If you go over here a little bit, I'll give you a bit of a tour... So this pullout has all of my hand drilling apparatus. This one up here has <laughs> all of my hammers, mallets, brass mallets, nail sets. This one over here has my panel gauge, my level, uh, my, my sliding T-bevel, my protractor, my winding sticks. And then this one down here will have all of my saws. Over here, this one has all my files, multiple different files. This is all of my rasps, R-A-S-P-S. -S. These are files for wood, if you want to put it crudely. Here are my screwdrivers, but people walk away with them all the time, so there aren't many there. Over here are all of my planes, the planes that I use. Eight, seven, six, five and a half. Ten and a quarter, four and a half, forty and a half scrub, one twelve. This is the large, uh, large scraping plane. Eighty-five. This is the scraping plane with the tilting handles, front and back. This is a butt mortise plane. This is a rabbiting block plane. The blade goes on both sides. This is a small block plane. Underneath here are all kinds of things. I try to categorize them. This has junk. That one has more junk. I can't know what's in that. Anyway. Jake's telling me to hurry up. So we built it. We numerous, and then we just started working with it, meaning using it. And we changed it multiple times. By the way, this lifts up. There's a little catch in here. And in back are all of my carving chisels that I don't use very often. That's why they get second billing. Down here is our till where we keep all of our saws. We do this so that we don't waste all the space above it. This section, once we, and this, this has evolved over years, once, once we liked it and we had it the way we want it, then we, okay, now we'll convert it into the finished piece. So this section where we keep all the shooting boards, this is, this is done. That's done. It's completed over to here. Now, this section is ready to complete. The drawers are cut, ready to be made. This pullout will be done. We just did this door, and that door we have all the parts. And then we'll start up here. So it's divided into six sections. And once we get down there, we'll start on here and we'll work our way across. So no, it's not done, but it is in the process and it could take a while. But check it out. It's all, 
up to this point is all on the online workshop. When you join, you get access to everything on there. 12 years of content. Next. Don't forget to sign up for the draw. And we're giving away tonight, we're giving away three Dead Cat sweaters. We're giving away the, uh, the uh, bench casters that have been beefed up and a package of aluminum bench dogs from, from uh, Schoberg, the ones we like for our Cosman bench. All right, let's whip through these. We have four left. Okay. Whip through? Well, I, that's why I'm telling them now. Oh, okay, five minutes each. All right, this is from a user called Steel Wood. And he says, do you use metric rather than imperial on projects? And this Never. Is, this is from Brisbane, Australia. Sorry. I lived in the United States when Canada converted, so I'm all imperial. All right. Uh, this one comes from DKG30 in the chat. He says, does or has Rob ever used a spindle molder? Are they worth having in a small workshop? Uh, you know what? I have two. We have two? Or three? Shapers. Yeah, whatever. Uh, no. Eh. They sound like, it's, it's like sticking a piece of wood into a helicopter blade, not doing it. When you get those big uh, cutters that big in diameter and turn that thing on, that is a scary operation. Um, they've kind of lost popularity. And if you're in mass producing kitchen doors now, you can buy them cheaper than you can buy the materials to make them. So I, uh, I, I make lots of doors, but I avoid having to use a shaper. It's just too dangerous, never liked it, and no. I have, I have them. We use it. What do we use our shaper for in there? For gluing, for gluing up shooting boards. So, yeah, that's what we use ours for. Next. Because that's like the microwave used for a clock. All right. Uh, Luke Pantelli. Hi, Luke. He says, what power capacity do you require, did you require for your new shop to run all your equipment? Jake? 60 amp, but our air compressor and our, compre and our dust collector are on the main shop's panel. So we've got so. a 60 amp fuse here, our entrance yeah. here. Remember, you're a one-man shop, so exception of your dust collector and your compressor, you're only going to use one machine at a time. So you're never going to need more than that. And as Jake mentioned, those two heavy use, the, the compressor we have is a five horse and there's a three horse on the dust collector. They're using drawing power from the other shop. So you can get away with uh, less, less than 60 amp for a one man shop. I think the biggest, what's the biggest draw in here? Saw stop? Probably. No, the thickness planer. Yeah, but the thickness planer is a slow start, so oh, it would be it's the a, It's a three-phase motor. Yeah. So the biggest motor we have in here running anything is the three-horse, and that's on, wired on 220. You're only going to take 15 amps running, 15 amps. The draw, the start might be 20 or 25, but next, Rick, how am I doing? Yeah. Three minutes apiece? Surprising. Uh, next one comes from So, so Crazy Lady. I forget who that is, but that's her username. We know her, but anyway. If you were going... We're back. Well, okay, I want to congratulate all the winners. Hope you really <laughs> enjoy your prizes. You didn't miss it. Okay, we still got time. Next question. It looks like we need more than 60 amps. <laughs> According to Charlie. Um, did we answer that last one? What was the question? Oh, per no. The question was, what would be the perfect shop? So my perfect first, size. My first shop I grew into was 29 by 29, two levels. The next shop in here was 75 feet by 35 feet, which is way too big. Uh, I need to bike. So I'm thinking this is going to be the perfect size. In fact, I really have seen, I have not seen any indication that this is going to be too small or too big. This just feels perfect. I would tell you that the, probably the aspect of this that I like most is the height. Having 10-foot ceilings is great. Not only does it give you that feeling that you're not confined, but, excuse me, it allows you to do with stuff that, um, like moving around a sheet of 
Imagine trying to move around a sheet of plywood in an, with an eight-foot ceiling, an eight-foot sheet of paper. You're having to drag it on the floor. So you can do lots of stuff. Tw what, what are we, Jake? 26 by 34? No. 24, 24 by, by 36. 36. Why do I always say that backwards? I don't know. 24 by 36 is the magic number. Next, Frick. You must be, you must be but dyslexic. I am, think I am. All right, let's finish with, the, uh, with a mash trivia question. Oh. And then we'll do the draw. Go ahead. All right, this one comes from Jeff Church, and he says, Hey, Rob, Jeff. which actor from Cheers was on a MASH episode? Which actor? Well, uh, Norm got a pool ball stuck in his mouth, and Charles had to dig it out. But uh, Shelley Long was also a nurse on there. So uh, Woody Harrelson never was. Um, did you know that Kramer, Kramer was on Cheers one time as a guest? I saw that the other day for the first time. So those two, he, he may not have realized, but there was actually two MASH, or Cheers actors on MASH. All right, tell us what we're giving away, All right. and we'll do the draw. So our prizes tonight, hopefully, how many people have signed up for the draw? I'm counting them right now. Okay. 637. All right, so there's going, and how, what, are we, what are we giving away? Uh, we're at 1,700. So, so only one prize? So we're giving away three dead cat sweaters, and we're going to give away a uh, set of casters for your bench. Those are the ones that Willie has beefed up that will uh, never fail you. We give away uh, one prize for every $1,000 increment, and at, at current stand, we have $1,700 worth in donations towards the Purple Heart. So that's one prize. Somebody wants to fix that, you got a matter of a few minutes. Last chance to get registered for the draw. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. Promise you, you'll enjoy it. Lots of good information. Um, stay tuned. That, that's our easiest way to communicate with you as far as upcoming shows, or upcoming uh, workshops special thank you to all the people that are here tonight appreciate all of the help everybody everybody contributes to make this a uh, success we almost had a perfect episode almost. yeah we did right there at the end you stuck your thumb on something you should have got 61 amps all right you ready yeah okay. these are the first three of the dead cats let me just make sure there's no last minutes All right, your chances of winning tonight are 1 in 642. So the first winner, Dead Cat, you said? Yeah. Here we go. First Dead Cat winner is Don Esri in North Carolina. Congratulations, he's, Don. He's won before. Has he really? I think so. That sound looks familiar. All right, Dead Cat number two. Cool night, cool, cool night along the coast. It'll keep you cozy. Chris Abbott in Ontario. Hey, Chris. Thank, congratulations. Northern Ontario, you'll need it now. Three dead cats we're doing? Yeah. Number three is Steve Price in Oromocto. <laughs> really? We could throw that to him. He Did he? Yeah. <laughs> congratulations, Steve. No refunds, by the way. <laughs> you, don't want, you don't want to put your dead cat away just yet. Such is our spring. All right, what's next? We're still in spring. Caster. We're the 21st, aren't we? Winner of the casters okay. is... Okay, set of casters going to, drum roll. Robert Craig in Texas. Hey, Robert, congratulations. Make sure we've got your contact information. So if you want a dead cat sweater, you need to contact us. Tell us what size. They're available in small, medium. Dave, Super Dave wears medium. Large, extra large, double and triple extra large. Yeah. So we can accommodate most everybody. And uh, casters are one size fits all. Thanks, folks. Appreciate your support. Remember, check out our website. Read up on the Purple Heart Project to understand what we do. It is our mission to introduce the peace and joy of hand tool woodworking into the lives of these people that need it the most. And we're happy to do it for everybody. That's why we do so much as, as much as we do on our YouTube channel. Big thank you to Super Dave for being out there and to Luther as always. He does, he's not in front of the camera, but trust me. What happens here is a result of what he does. So he's the, uh, he's, he's, what do we call him? No, nicely, what do we call him? He's the cog. He's the main cog. 
the kernel. Anyway, we'll see you guys in two weeks. We'll post what we're doing, and you'll be able to follow up. And uh, hopefully the shop will be even better by then. See you.